right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the American Academy of Emergency Medicine Women in EM section. Um, this is a series of virtual mentorship um, specifically for osteopathic medical students. So thank you so much for everyone who is joining live or if you are listening to this being recorded. Um, my name is Katie Wazinski. I am a third year osteopathic medical student, and I'm really excited to be the moderator for tonight's session, which is titled, Should You or Should You Not Apply to um, Emergency Medicine Residency? So if you all saw the advertisements for this, we have a handful of broad topics that um, I hope to cover, um, which will be very timely, especially as some updates have, have just come out. So um, also before we get started, um, this session is totally interactive. Um, if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat um, and I will read it out loud. Or if you have a question and wanna raise your hand and then I can um, call on you so you can unmute yourself um, if you feel more comfortable doing that. Um, or if you wanna direct message me so um, you don't have your name out there with your question, um, feel free. Our panelists tonight are wonderful and they will um, answer brutally honest, um, I believe. So if you want to start out, um, take a moment, just put in the chat where you're coming from. I'm sure we have a handful of students coming from different parts of the country. So just say hi, put a little shout out to whatever city um, or potentially country you're coming from. And then while you're doing that, I am going to start by introducing our wonderful panelists while I have the screen up. So starting from the left, we have Dr. Deborah Pierce. Um, Dr. Pierce is the program director at Einstein, and she has been so for the past five years. She initially completed her residency at Einstein, then worked at Cooper for eight years as an APD, and then she's come back to Einstein, went to work in a community hospital for a few years, and then she's back <laughs> at Einstein, um, first as APD and now PD. Um, I'm sorry, she probably has been PD for more than eight years, for more than five years, for eight years. <laughs> um, she completed two years as medical staff president and now chair of the credentials committee. And she's involved with AEM. What does Dr. Pierce not do? Outside of work, she has two wonderful daughters who are in college and she loves to play tennis. So if you want to wave Dr. Pierce. Next up, we have Dr. Kristen Smith. She is a clinical assistant professor of emergency medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Her academic expertise includes health equity education for the emergency provider, integration of health equity into simulation education, medical student pipeline development, and mentorship. And we are really lucky to have her at AEM. At Penn, Dr. Smith is the faculty liaison for the Emergency Medicine Interest Group, or EMIG. Um, she holds several leadership positions um, in national and local emergency medicine organization. Outside of work, Dr. Smith enjoys sightseeing, museum hopping, traveling, and spending time with friends and family. So welcome, Dr. Smith. We also have next up is Dr. Jenny Reyes. She is clinical faculty at the Staten Island University Hospital Emergency Medicine Residency Program. She is assistant professor at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine and is the co-lead of the Northwell Human Trafficking Heart Eastern Region. Welcome, Dr. Reyes. Lucky to have you. And finally, we have Alina Matina, Dr. Alina Matina. She is an emergency medicine resident working in Yonkers, New York. She immigrated to America from Ukraine with her mother when she was seven years old and has discovered that through emergency medicine, she can integrate her passions for teaching, diverse community outreach, and serving as a frontline doctor. When she is not working at the hospital, she is long distance running, engaging with her followers followers on social media and exploring New York City with her fiance. Um, and I have your social medias, but if you want to put them in the chat to um, self-promote, um, certainly do so. Um, so I'm going to stop screen sharing so I can get to my kind of outline of questions. Um, 
So first off, I know we had wonderful introductions, but um, I kind of want to start. Um, so each of the panelists, if you could, we have a whole range from residents to faculty to PD. Um, so this whole session is um, why should a student, whether they be a first year or potentially a third year who are really thinking critically about applying to EM, what drew you to the field um, and what do you love about emergency medicine still? I'm happy to call on y'all, or if you just want to speak out, that's cool too. Well, I'll go ahead and break the silence. I'm excited to hear about all the different perspectives and the timeline that everyone's excited to look forward to about the future of emergency medicine. I know that in the background, maybe the elephant in the room was we were thinking about what the future of emergency medicine is gonna look like, uh, especially what we saw with COVID and burnout and just the shifts that we saw in the hospital setting in general. Um, I think if you get really technical, we start to kind of peel back the numbers about the estimate of the overproduction of emergency medicine, you know, the expansion of the residency programs, all of these unfilled positions that took place in the latest match, et cetera. Um, but what I think overall is really reassuring is that, that the attrition rate that we estimated, which is basically the rate of emergency medicine physicians leaving the field and thus applying new positions for those entering the field uh, was very underestimated. Um, basically, when you know we published these numbers and predicted what the field would look like um, as far as positions available and filled, and that's kind of what we're all thinking about, especially as students are starting to apply for residency. Um, we thought that number was about 3%, uh, give or take. Um, and given the number of new residency positions and the attrition rate in the market at that time, we thought there'd be um, a surplus of, um, you know, over um, 7,000 um, positions. So, but since the attrition rate was over 4% last year, I know COVID is not, you know, um, representative of what we want the market to, you know, ever look like in the future. Um, you know, it was still upwards of 5%. So while we kind of were thinking it was going to be pretty, um, you know, challenging, it was definitely challenging. Uh, but thankfully, um, you know, it wasn't as um, severe as we kind of thought it was going to be. That said, it was still very difficult um, for the class that just graduated, um, but everyone in my residency program was able to get a position that they wanted to be in your family or the programs they liked the most. Um, but we'll definitely get more into the complexities of the geography and the type of patient population you want to work, rural versus urban and all of those things. So we'll, I'll be happy to dive into more details as more people have more questions. I can add on to that too, Katie. <clears throat> I I have to tell you guys that when I hear people talking about burnout and that kind of stuff in emergency medicine, sure, that kind of thing is real in any field, right? So it's real in surgery, it's real in any profession, out, even outside of medicine. But the reality is, I can tell you honestly that I've been doing this for over 20 years and I still love taking care of patients every day. It is a great, great specialty. It is not going anywhere. When you hear people, the naysayers say, oh, emergency medicine is going to not exist in five years. That's absolutely absurd. It's not true. It is a fun, fun, fun profession. I, I go home from every shift feeling fulfilled and um just by at least one case, if not many, many cases, every single shift I work, I still love doing it. And I've been doing it for a long time and am not burned out. I think that you have to do what you're passionate about. You have to do what you love. You have to want to do a certain field of medicine. You have to want to do medicine in general, but a certain field because it just, it, you have this inner um, passionate about it that, and it makes you tick. <clears throat> it's, you know, the concept of wellness. Wellness is about what you do every day. And it's about being fulfilled with what you do every day. So um, if you think emergency medicine is, is what is going to make you tick, don't let anybody tell you that it's not. And don't let anybody tell you that, oh, you're going to get burned out or any of that. You go with your passion and 
you will love it as much as I still do. And I really am very, very honest about that. And then also my residents had no trouble finding jobs this year. And I just today was talking to a chair and a, a actually a director of a pretty large hospital um, service. And he said that they have many, many openings. He personally feels like there's flaws in, in the, um, the work report. And he said, we can't find people to fill all of our jobs. So it's interesting, the different perspectives. Um, I think there's a lot of loud voices that are negative, but I think it'll be fine. And certainly by the time you guys are out looking for jobs, the pendulum is going to come back down and calm down. And, you know, five years from now, this will probably all start to kind of work itself out. So I encourage you to, to go with what, um, what you feel passionate about. Yeah, and kind of going off of what Dr. Pierce said, um, <clears throat> you know, there's always negative voices out there. People are always, <laughs> negative voices are very loud. But if you have a really positive outlook and just pursue what your heart desires, you're going to have positive outcomes, you know, like positivity draws more positivity in the world. And so, you know, I'm a second year resident in my program and I'm so happy, you know, we work in a small hospital, but our volume is so high. I see amazing cases. I learn from every single day. I feel like I'm growing exponentially. My third years are having no problems finding jobs um, in, you know, the New York area, which is really congested with lots and lots of residents. Um, and then also emergency medicine is the coolest field. You get to, you know, like an ENT is an ENT, but they're still <laughs> going to call you about their questions about abdominal pain. You know what I mean? Because you know a little bit about everything. So uh, also coolest people, like you will work with some phenomenal people with great positive outlooks in life because we all are a happy bunch. So yeah. <laughs> I guess I'll just like echo that. Um, I definitely think there'd be no other field for me than emergency medicine. And I think honestly, if you are drawn to emergency medicine, which obviously everyone on this call is because you're attending this call, then there's really no specialty in medicine where you are going to feel happy because we get the variety of everything. We get procedures, we get all of it. So I think that you know, if you have an interest in emergency medicine, you truly won't be fulfilled in any other specialty um, just because of everything that we see. I mean, I just had a shift a few days ago where, you know, you had the common cold, someone coming in with flu, uh, uh, ascending cholangitis, also had someone come in altered mental status, needed central line, A line, intubation all within like the th first 30 minutes. So like, you just, there's no other specialty where you are going to have that variety. So I, I love emergency medicine. I really couldn't see myself practicing in any other specialty. So I think Dr. Smith just answered my next question, but if you were, let's say a third year in my shoes um, right now, thinking about applying to emergency medicine with all of these changes, and we'll get into kind of the workforce nitty gritty in just a second, um, but would you change your mind and, um, or would you still apply to emergency medicine? It sounds like Dr. Smith would say yes, if you were um, a medical student right now, but um, curious what what the rest of your thoughts are. Sure, I'll go ahead. It's a no-brainer. I am so, so happy that I went into emergency medicine. It actually wasn't even at the forefront. Uh, when I started medical school, I wanted to go into pediatrics, and I even went on some pediatric interviews. And the irony is my husband went into pediatrics, and I converted him to the dark side. So now he's doing a pediatric emergency medicine fellowship. So he clearly saw the energy and just like thriving and just being so in love with our specialty. So it's absolutely a no brainer. Pre-COVID, po post-COVID, 100% the best field. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt about it. You, I, I did a year of OB before I did emergency medicine. 
And um, I would absolutely not turn back. Um, and none of my residents would. I My residents are all very, very positive, um, happy people that are very fulfilled by what they're choosing. So um, there's not, absolutely, I would choose emergency medicine again. Yeah, and obviously I'm a little further behind <laughs> than you guys, you know, second year, but uh, my fiance is uh, an attending and he is uh, six years out you know, he's nine years ahead of me and we love emergency medicine. This is an emergency medicine household. We come in and, you know, we talk about all the crazy cases he teaches me. I remind him and, you know, it's just a cool job. And again, I want to emphasize how, you know, everything and we're just a bunch of super passionate people, my attendings and my co-residents, we're just like happy, go lucky. And you have to be happy, go lucky um, in this kind of crazy crazy job and all the things we see so um lots of like hearts filled with love so yeah it's a great great job I was going to say that maybe I should have tried to find a naysayer to put on this panel because you all seem so positive. But I think that um, what Dr. Medina said um, just about the culture of the people that go into emergency medicine, it absolutely, um, I mean, there will be kind of oddballs in any specialty, but I think especially with emergency medicine, we attract a certain type of person. Um, so I think it, it would be hard for for a lot of people to say, to say, no, they wouldn't do emergency medicine again. Um, so now Dr. Ray, as you kind of introduced this, um, but I wanted to bring up the initial workforce study that, um, I believe was published in 2020, um, kind of analyzed 2013 to 2019, um, data, um, compared to some of the updates that, um, we saw come out this year. Um, so, does someone want to briefly um, describe the initial workforce study um, versus where we're at now? Um, I know that I can put um, the titles in the chat if anyone um, wants to look up these um, articles. I have three really good ones. Um, and actually, I just tweeted, so I can put my Twitter too if you want to look at the links. But um, yeah, does someone want to just briefly um, describe for maybe some of the younger students on here what that was all about, what it said, and where we are right now? Okay, I'm not going to pretend to be like a statistician or even a significant, you know, contributor to this information. And so please, if any of this is incorrect on your end, please tell me. But um, in general, in 2020, we tried to estimate the outlook of the workforce because our goal is still very um, valid where we want to provide high quality emergency medicine providers, um, fully recognizing, you know, the um, you know, distribution of um, hospitals and emergency medicine um, facilities around the country and this disparity, right? Um, fully realizing all the new residency programs that are opening and how that affects the pipeline. So, you know, there were um, about an increase of 27% in the residency programs in just 2018 alone. So as you could imagine, you know, afterwards there were more positions that were unfilled. So the concern was with all of these, you know, graduating emergency medicine residents, are there just not going to be enough jobs, right? Is it going to be more difficult to obtain a position that you, you're happy with, that you're having to kind of not being able to pick and choose? Um, so what they basically um, are looking at is first just the attrition rate, which is the rate that physicians in emergency medicine leave the field. Um, and they were estimating it's usually about 3%. Um, but then, of course, there's, um, you know, the amount of patients that are seen by um, providers that are not emergency medicine um, physicians. So that's about 20% that are seen by PAs, NPs. So that's also a number factored in. Um, and then there's the number of new residency positions, right? So that's more um, input into this pipeline. Um, so overall, they estimated um, that by 2030, there was going to be um, about a surplus of 7,845 um, emergency medicine docs. And someone correct me if I'm wrong, but just a huge, huge surplus. Um, but they also said 
hey, if we're off 1%, if it's not 3% attrition rate, if it's just 4%, um, then this drops way down to like 2,486. So this is a huge estimate with a huge shift in numbers. Um, and so they actually realized that last year the attrition rate was, I believe, 5.3%. So as you could imagine, you know, it wasn't as stark as we all thought it was going to be. Um, I don't think it's, un, I, I don't know if it's unwise to say, oh, well, this is how it's going to be going forward. You know, obviously last year was very different. I'm not saying this 5.3% attrition rate is going to be representative going forward. Um, but I do think that a lot of the input was causing a little bit of caution. And, you know, like many other things that we're always cautious about, it just didn't really pan out that way. Um, but anyway, those are some of the numbers. Um, it just shows how, like the drastic changes that occur where we don't, we can't predict everything. Um, but what was really helpful is that um, a lot of the positions that have become more available um, are in very desirable locations. Um, so there's been a lot of shifts in certain cities, even cities that had a higher proportion of emergency medicine density. Um, like positions that are filled still grew, <laughs> like Michigan, um, like other high density areas are like DC. Um, and then obviously there's a ton of rural positions available um, and that are always growing like South Dakota and, and Arkansas and Montana had like the highest growth um, recently. So just a lot of shifts um, that are taking place, but certainly not nearly as pessimistic as we thought it would be um, in that particular year. Yeah, and I think I'll just add a little bit to that, Jen. The So it's very important whenever you look at any kind of study um, or try to analyze any data that you put it in context <clears throat> and understand some of the background and what was the hypothesis and that kind of thing. So a lot of this kind of um, concern and fury, if you will, came out of a time that was kind of a perfect storm. So when COVID hit, Num emergency medicine visits went down dramatically. So as an example, our visits at Einstein were like a hundred and some thousand, a hundred plus like 6,000 or something the year before COVID hit. And the year COVID hit, we were down to 88,000. So a drop of 20% in patient visits. Mm. When you look at that, physicians who are covering emergency departments when the patients went down so much, even though the acuity was up, the, the numbers of physicians needed, especially in people that had jobs where they were being paid by, you know, the day or the hour, they weren't needed in the same, that, to cover the same volume. So people lost hours that the hospitals weren't making the same money that they made previous to COVID. And therefore, they weren't having the income to pay the emergency physicians. So they cut some of the hours. That was unheard of, never happened before. So that put everybody into a panic. Um, that was happening in every field. So internal medicine was having the same struggles. And they were trying to find ways to keep the internal medicine physicians employed by introducing you know, um, telehealth and all that kind of stuff. Surgeons were... To have their salaries cut. I, if you get right, you know, if you start to look into it, other specialties had the same situation because they weren't doing elective surgeries. They weren't doing money-making kind of things. <clears throat> so that happened at the same time that we had this dramatic growth in residency programs. So all of a sudden people said, holy cow, we're having all our positions cut and we're going to have all these additional graduates. What are we going to do with this situation? We need to analyze it. And thus the workforce study got created and, and came out. And it, it was very much riding a wave that was happening that was a little bit artificial because it was about a pandemic. So now that we're coming at, starting to come out of the pandemic and numbers are coming back up, things are settling down and it's not looking anywhere near as bleak as it looked two and a half years ago. Um, and most of the academicians think that, you know, this is going to be a good correction because we probably do have a few too many residency programs that are, and they were just all of a sudden exploding with residency programs. And the ACGME got the message that maybe you shouldn't be approving all these residency programs and maybe we should back off a little bit and calm down with the growth. And the um, 
you know, students are this year, we're seeing a decrease in the number of students. Overall applications were down by 18%. So we're gonna, we're having a correction and it probably is good that we're having a correction. But the reality is people realize that as does with everything, the pendulum swings and it always swings to an extreme and then it comes down and balances somewhere in the middle. And it seems that the pendulum probably swung to an extreme out of you know, kind of a perfect storm and now it's starting to come back. Um, I agree with everything that's been said. I mean, um, I think also you have to think about emergency medicine. It's one of the newest specialties that uh, is around. You know, they we didn't have the first EM resident until 1970. So it's a very new specialty. And um, I've read a few articles that have said, you know, EM, the good thing is there are so many avenues that we can work in, disaster medicine, geriatrics. So there's all these other opportunities besides just, you know, being in an emergency room at a particular hospital. Um, I would say that for um, folks on this call, if you're like, I want to go through residency and I then I want to go to a specific city and only work at this one institution, you know, nowhere else in the whole city, then yeah, you may be a little bit limited. Um, however, most cities have numerous emergency departments. There's so many other avenues that you can go into. So I think that um, as with all fields in medicine, we're just seeing that, you know, there's more um, uh, other providers and things like that happening, I do think that you have to, with any field that you go into, you have to really understand what your skill set is and be willing to kind of maybe look outside of where where you think you may want to go when there's so many opportunities for you. So I'm very curious, Dr. Pierce, you brought up that um, applications um, have been down um, this cycle. And um, I'm sure as a lot of us know, a lot of programs went unfilled last year. So in the context of um, the majority of us being osteopathic students and physicians, how do you think this plays into kind of our game plan of applying to residencies um, at, or does it at all? Um, yeah, <laughs> I think that you so we get data every year about the match and the there's um, it's public data that's available. You should go look on the NRMP website and you can see how, what the relationship is to the number of applications that you do to whether or not you match. And that number, it typically comes to a point that like 99 percent of people match if they have. 14, 12 to 14 interviews or something like that. So there's that data that can drive how many places you apply to. Um, certainly it's hugely beneficial to do audition rotations and you wanna do your homework ahead of time and make sure that you set up, set yourself up for success. So you plan to do an audition rotation someplace that you may want to go for residency, but also that will give you a good slow and be a well-recognized um, have a well-recognized reputation to have that that letter of recommendation. A slow is a standardized letter of recommendation comes out of a rotation that you do at an institution that has a residency program. You can also get them at institutions that don't have residency programs, but they're very helpful when they come from an institution with a residency program because they they're they compare people. It's it's a letter of recommendation that is not just written by an individual that says you're awesome. It compares you to the rest of the cohort of students that are rotating there. So it provides for me much more information than a standard letter of recommendation that just says everybody's great. Um, so you need to do your homework and prepare, and then you do great on your rotations. And it's amazing. I am honestly seeing that, that the perspective of um, osteopathic, considering osteopathic applicants has is really very, very, very quickly growing um, since the single pathway was instituted three years ago now, I guess. And um, 
I even had a, I just interviewed yesterday, a, um, a student from Brown. So from an Ivy League institution. And he said, you know, I think it is so cool that your program has diversity, including um, male, female, different gender or different, um, you know, the other diversities. And he said, and really, especially, I think it's so cool that you have a mix of MDs and DOs. And that came out of the mouth of, you know, a, an Ivy League student. So it people's awareness of osteopathic medicine is growing. And I think through the GME world, becoming more um, familiar with people working side by side. And to be honest, the DO residents are often so much better because you you just work harder for everything and, and very commonly don't take anything for granted. Um, so DOs are always the stronger residents and they end up being the chief residents in programs. And um, it will it will pay off well for you. So I think that you go for it. I think that you plan and then you do well on your rotations. You set yourself up for success and then you just make sure that you apply to enough places. And um, I think that the success of osteopathic candidates is is showing to be pretty much online with the MD candidates. Right. So, yeah, um, I go to a mixed uh, residency and I have residents from Brown and Georgetown and, you know, um, as a DO, you always feel like the underdog, you know, so I went into residency being like, oh, I need to prove myself to these people. And then at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, wait, I'm the same. <laughs> I'm doing the same things. I think the same way. And it's totally equal. So, you know, I don't know what happened in the pathway, but at the end, we're all in the same place. We're all getting the same training and we all come out the same. So don't feel like an underdog anymore. You're the same and just do what you got to do to get to where you want to be. But don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't ever, nobody should ever put all your eggs. There. Those are the people that don't match, even the superstars that don't match because the match is a numbers game and it is, you have to make sure that you have, you can't take anything for granted as far as assuming that you're, you know, you did a great rotation in this place and, you know, it's sold. You have to figure that there were 30 other people that did a great rotation in that place that you're going to be put on a list and you might be equal to them. But if you happen to be number 20 and they're matching 18, then you may not match. And it's not that you wouldn't have been great for them. It's just a numbers game. So you have to play the numbers and make sure that you have uh, your options. So you bring up a few points that I would love all of your opinions on. So playing the numbers game ever since COVID um, interviews are virtual um, and, you know, Considering that a lot of programs did not match, I feel like there were rumblings of, um, especially osteopathic students, because I know our advising is increase the number of programs you apply to, increase the number of interviews you um, should target and accept. Um, so from your perspective, how is that mentality changing at all, considering we are in this virtual environment? Um, I know a lot of my friends who are fourth years um, because of the fact that applications are down and because the fact that they are amazing candidates, they have so many interviews. And I'm curious um, if that's kind of across the board, how that will change things. Um, is it okay to take that many interviews? Um, I know it's a lot of questions, but um, considering we're in this um, virtual landscape of things changing, um, what is your perspective on kind of osteopathic targets um, and I know everyone, every um, applicant is an individual, but kind of overall, like, should I sacrifice Let me just, my oops. interviews for the goodness of everyone? Um, Maybe at some point. So let me just take that on. I don't want to be the only person talking here, but let me just answer that one question because I can give you some, some background and some good data. Um, so the at CORD, the program directors all discussed what happened last year. And the feeling is that the problem last year was that 
most people interviewed the same top one third of candidates. And that is why we ended up where we ended up, that the top programs filled and other programs didn't, but we all interviewed the same cohort of people. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that overall, most program directors this year are approaching evaluating applications much more holistically. Um, We're looking not just at, you know, superstar board scores, superstar whatever, but the um, candidates as a whole. And that is, I think, going to pay off well across the board. So, you know, considering people that are in the middle of the list as really, really, really great candidates. And those folks may end up at the top of the lists for different programs. So um, I think that it will be much more successful this year for candidates and for programs, and um, that you should be very optimistic. Um, That said, number of interviews. So if you are having more than 14 interviews, I would say 12 to 14 interviews, because that tends to be the number that guarantees a match. If you're if you've got more than that and you have no interest in the program, I would say that it would be possibly the right thing to do to cancel that interview and let somebody else get that interview spot. I am the PD of a four year program. There are absolutely students out there who do not want to do a four year program. 28% of the programs are four years. If you are not going to do a four-year program and you don't care how much you would love Einstein, you're not doing a four-year program, then don't take an interview spot. It's okay. There's lots of other great three-year programs out there. Go and then leave that for somebody else. Um, So I think there is a time to give up your interview spots, but I don't think that you should say, oh my gosh, I have 10 and my friend has six. I should give up four. Don't do that. Don't, you know, wait till you're over that 14 number. And then if you're, if you're interviewing somewhere just because, and you think that there's no chance you would ever go there, then I would step in. Okay. I'll stop talking now. (laughs) No, that's perfect advice. It obviously also matters if you're like couples matching or something. So I have a very unique path. Um, I was a DO, my husband's an MD, we couples matched. So of course we interviewed at way more programs, Um, but we also only ranked the ones that we're willing to go to. So like I was born in El Paso, Texas. So he, I interviewed in El Paso and we said, are we going to go to El Paso, Texas? It's really going to happen. So we only ranked the places that we were both really committing to going. So the same applies that we're not going to take anyone else's spot unless we're actually dedicated to a program. Um, And it does matter what type of candidate you are. Like I did factor that in my board scores into my number of programs. Um, But I also consider my quality of slows. And so if they're like high quality with this board score, I target this number. But again, um, it's always like grass is greener on the other side. If I could virtually do more interviews, I would probably accept a couple of other, um, you know, possibilities. But just the traveling and everything was just really expensive. So I know it's not the same because everyone wants to go in person. There's like that personal touch, it's really irreplaceable. Um, but that said, I may have applied to a couple of different programs given if I had the time since it was virtual. So all these little factors kind of come into play. Yes, it's a super tough topic to advise on a large scale, but I really appreciate um, those comments. Um, so we do have a question in the chat. Dr. Pierce is already too quick, but I'll read it out loud if anyone else wants to comment. Um, So us third years, um, I believe, are the first application cycle to have um, Comlex 1, Step 1, Pass, Fail. Um, So obviously, everyone is shifting focus on Step 2, Level 2 being the thing that all the programs look at. Uh, But what else can we do, um, maybe besides um, scores and slows, to really stand out on applications? I mean, it's it's the same that you were doing before. You want to make sure that you show that, like, 
you want to be an emergency medicine physician. So that means being active in your school, in the emergency medicine interest group, um, maybe taking on a leadership role, um, you know, taking time to go to national conferences. So AEM, ASAP, uh, also showing that you have a spirit for like volunteering and patient advocacy. So making sure that those pieces of your application are tight. And then definitely, as Dr. Pierce said, making sure that you knock Comlex 2 out the park, because now that Comlex 1 is uh, pass fail, you won't have that, you know, score there. So you do want to make sure that you're doing well on Comlex 2. And you do have to put a little extra emphasis on your rotations because you want to make sure that your slows are, are really good. So you want to make sure that before you're having your first rotation that you're preparing. So maybe you're reading up on um, some of the basic etiologies of chest pain, or you're taking some time before you go on your first rotation and listening to the EM Basics podcast so you know, okay, what type of question should be, I be asking? Or you're looking at the article on the three-minute EM uh, presentation. So you already have some of those little simple things that we're going to teach you on rotations. You've heard about it at least. So now you're fine tuning and you're coming, you're showing up to rotations with a little bit more than just, you know, basic, I, I don't know anything about EM. You're coming in and you're showing, I'm really interested and I've done some of the initial homework that I should have done to enter this field. I think also um, you should, you know, when you are actually applying, you should really think about writing a strong personal statement. Um, I, you know, have kind of gone through it recently, you know, two years ago, whatever, but my personal statement, I worked really, really hard on and um, it, it showed, you know, I had 14 interviews and each one of my interviewers asked about my personal statement, like thoroughly read it. So that's something you can do to really enhance your application. Yeah, and it's um just a little, um, a little pearl in your personal statement. Figure out how to try to let people know who you are, where you're coming from, what your interests are. You know, why do you want to be at a smaller community hospital to train? Why do you want to be at a big academic center to train? Why do you want to be at a county safety net hospital to train? Why, you know, if you have a concept of what you want to do, you know, if you think you want to do tox or PEM or something like that in your future, like figure out a way to kind of get across in your personal statement um, who you are and, and where you, what you think you might want to do in a generic kind of way. You don't have to say, oh, I want to be in Philadelphia at blah, blah, blah. But, um, but it's helpful. Like if I have an application from California to my program, I'm going to look at that and say, you know, why would that person want to come to Philadelphia? And you may not want to come to Philadelphia, but you might want to come to a big city to a safety net hospital. And that's what's driving you to apply to Einstein. And that might have me look at your application as more likely than somebody who seems like they want to go to a small community hospital in rural America. And why would they apply to Einstein? Why would they want to come to Philadelphia? Um, so try to make that personal statement um, give the the program director and APD's information to have them pay attention to your application. So a bit more on applications, someone in the chat brought up um, how important are um, evaluations and even potentially letters of rec from um, non-EM rotation. So um, from your core rotation, say you really crush that IM rotation. Um, do you get a letter of rec from um, your preceptor? How important is it um, to have honored, um, you know, five out of the seven core rotations? Um, or really, is it just focusing on your auditions and your slows? 
It definitely looks amazing if you're honoring in that many rotations. I mean, I'm not going to say that, you know, even the majority of, you know, candidates are honoring in all of them, you know, but I think it definitely adds more of an edge, especially, I mean, no one's having preference, but we do fall back on like our core principles and like our skill set that we have. So if you're doing really, really well in internal medicine, surgery and other, you know, core rotations, um, that is great and it's definitely noticed. Um, so I don't want to put pressure on anyone to honor across the board, but it definitely, definitely is noticed. Um, it's also noticed if you just have a really high quality letter. I mean, obviously everything about the slow is almost too perfectly considered like the person, the evaluator and their background and how many you know, students they evaluate and if they usually evaluate very favorably or if they're very critical. And so this is a very high quality letter, but that said, um, if you performed really well in a particular rotation where that experience really adds a greater skill set and maybe makes you a stronger candidate because of that experience, um, then it will stand out and it will also be a very, um, you know, important letter as well. I can tell you, though, I, I just have to say um, the usually when I see letters of recommendation, standard letters of recommendation from like an internal medicine or, or peds or something like that, they're always good. They just, because you're not going to ask somebody that's going to write you a poor letter to write a letter. And if you, if somebody thinks they're going to write you a poor letter really ethically, they should tell you that. And then you're not going to have them write a letter. So I don't know that I've ever seen a letter, a regular letter recommendation that's ever said that somebody wasn't perfect. And um, I, it, it would be a huge flag if they said that, but um, so that doesn't, they're not very valuable because of that where they're valuable is if you've done something significant, like if you worked with somebody on a research project that was important and they write a letter talking about you, you um, working on that research project or a project, a community service project, or um, a women in medicine project or something, or, you know, something you did in medical school. If there's somebody like that, that has, you've done something with them that has been um, formative, that would be a person, a good person to get a letter from that's much more valuable than just, you know, your nephro rotation where you really got along well with your um, nephrology <clears throat> professor. And not for nothing, I've had some letters of recommendation that are this long that people go to a surgeon and ask them for a letter of recommendation and, and it's a paragraph because that person just doesn't write letters and they don't write good letters. So I don't know. I think that it's go to somebody that is meaningful and add something in addition to your other information. And then as far as the honors, honor everything. You know, you go and I, if, if you pass Pete's, or you pass OBGYN, does that mean that you're just gonna, you're not really interested in it? And therefore every woman with vaginal bleeding early in pregnancy, you're gonna be like, eh, I'll just, I have to take care of them because they're in the ED, but I'm really not interested. And does that mean every kid in the emergency department, you're really not wanting to take care of? I don't know. I, if you do mediocre in a rotation, maybe you just didn't apply yourself. If you're smart enough to honor an EM, you're smart enough to honor in other rotations. And my impression, if you don't do that is, I'll give you that it might be a bit, better, but I also wonder what kind of effort you put into the rotation. So um, you will not honor in every rotation, but you need to give every rotation your all because that's important stuff on your application. All right, Dr. Pierce, the next uh, comat I'm studying for and cramming for, I'm going to be like, she told me to try my best and to honor. <laughs> um, yeah, but you don't, I don't, I, I don't want to, uh, what I'm saying is, yeah, give it your all as much as you can in every circumstance. People have life experiences that you have a bad rotation because, you know, you're, you had a tragedy in your family or something like that. All that stuff happens. We know all that. but. If you do your best in every rotation, that's going to come out in your dean's letter. It's going to come out in your application. It really, that, 
it's amazing how much you can read into these applications and figure out like what a person's work ethic is and what a person's, you know, drive is. And in emergency medicine, we want people who live on adrenaline, you know, we want people who are driven and stuff like that. So just set yourself up for success. Don't put, don't kill yourself. Don't stress yourself out constantly. Just get excited and go to your rotations with excitement to learn all you can about that area because you're going to be doing that in the future as an EM doc. And that is going to, that's going to pay off well for you. So we had one question in the chat um, in terms of some schools have different um, systems of grading. Um, is that taken into consideration if there is a high pass versus honors? Um, I know that pretty much every school is different um, in terms of their grading scale. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay, as we have just a few minutes left, feel free to put um, any dire questions in the chat. Um, oh, this is a good one. Um, someone asked, what would you say EM residents have in common personality and fit wise? Um, what sort of people are good EM doctors? Well, I'd say, you know, common personality so everyone in em is not a hiker or a rock climber i think that that is like the new stereotype that you go into em if you like to rock climb um but really <laughs> every really what drives people in em is liking variety so that's a big thing and usually they're people who are fairly laid back they're kind of you know more of the type b to be a physician not necessarily type b in general but type b you know, as physicians go, but that's because you have to be adaptable in emergency medicine. You never know what's going to come in. You may not have the, you know, supply that you need or the tool you need, but you have to figure out in the moment, well, how am I going to do X, Y, Z procedure that I need to do, even if I don't have this supply or tool or something. So people who are adaptable, people who are able to um, adapt to different situations, um, also, emergency medicine is big on camaraderie. So you have to be someone who is, you don't have to be the most friendly person by any means, but you have to have some decent communication skills because you have to call consultants. You have to speak to your nurses. You have to speak to a variety of patients that come in uh, from different walks of life. So you have to know how to communicate with people. Um, you do have to be uh, cognizant of, you know, your own implicit biases, right? So you have to have an idea of, okay, what are some things that I can do to make sure that I can speak to people again from all walks of life, knowing how to do different things. So I think it's definitely people who are adaptable, people who are go with the flow, easy going, thoroughness as well, because you want to make sure you don't miss something that is obvious or something that you should have caught by a good physical exam. Um, but you have to have all of those qualities. Yeah, and when you guys are going through your interviews, you know, when you will, um, it's going to be the 2 a.m. test. You know, we like, it gets kind of slow in the middle of the night. I got off, you know, four nights in a row. And sometimes you just need someone to talk to so you don't fall asleep on this white blanket that a million patients <laughs> have used, you know? And so, um, you know, 2 a.m. I was talking to seven nurses and just they were sharing their dating lives and it was just a good time. And can you be flexible and talk to all of these new friends that you're about to have? That's uh, that's definitely a big trait that a lot of emergency medicine doctors have. That's so true. I think what kind of makes it amazing because I've now worked with like totally different groups of ER physicians, whether it's in Texas or in Miami or in New York, um, we're all people, per persons, we're all, pers we're very like personable. <laughs> so we literally just like to learn about each other and like get to know complete strangers in like three seconds, you establish this rapport. And I think it's just really a testament to like the supportive nature that we have and um, like inquisitive nature. And so um, I think just having really good bedside manner goes so far. Um, but yeah, just being really personable, um, but also just like not too um, 
you know, nothing is more humbling um, than working in the ER. So I feel like it's impossible to develop this like big ego because we're constantly like brought to our knees by like the atypical case. So staying super humble, being personable and just being nice to every single person, every single nurse, custodial staff, you see them all the time and you're just friends with everyone. So that's just super important as well. Absolutely. I can um, agree with that. I um, was at ACOEP um, in the student section and one of the faculty there um, joked that the um, least important slash person with zero value in the emergency department is the medical student. So that means the custodian is far above the medical student um, in terms of value that they provide to the department. Obviously, the student is important in their own right, but I just thought that was a funny joke that, you know, you certainly have to know your place um, as a medical student and everyone really does provide provide value. Um, and as a student, it's important to understand that and really um, be kind to to everyone. Um, does anyone else have any comments on, um, someone asked a question about um, if someone has a GPA, and I assume this is in terms of preclinical curriculum, um, if they have a GPA, does that put them at an advantage or a disadvantage um, compared to schools that are pass-fail? If anyone has any quick notes, Dr. Pierce said GPA is not as big as performance in clinical rotations. Anyone has any conflicting perspectives? No. Okay, cool. I just have one quick question as we're wrapping up. I know we have been really positive this whole hour, but I do want to ask, um, and you're all in different um, parts of your career. Um, we talked about the best things and we talked about um, job market. What is one thing you would change or the worst thing about being an ER doc, would you say, that might dissuade a student to go into emergency medicine? Mine's easy because I love a routine, um, which is really ironic. I love a good bedtime routine. So for me, it's just the lack of lack thereof and just not having the same routine nine to five. Um, I'm not saying I want that per se, but, you know, I do have like um, a schedule that falls forward. So I'll work like 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. and then I'll work like nine to five and then I'll work, you know, 1 p.m. to like, you know, 11 p.m. So it kind of falls forward. But in so doing, it's nice because I get to sleep in a little bit every single day. Um, mm -hmm. But I also stay up a little bit later. So but in general, when I'm flip flopping a little bit, it can be a little tough um, to get that sweet spot to just go right to sleep. Um, but in general, I still sleep seven to eight hours a night. And usually the day is so packed and there's so many exciting things going on that I pretty much just have to hit the bed and I go to bed and it's not an issue. But in general, in theory, I would just say like the nice bedtime, you know, consistency. Um, but that said, you know, plenty of rest. Put everything important first because you'll make room for everything else. It's identical to that jar that you're filling with like rocks and then marbles and then smaller things and then sand at the very end. It's very true where if you just put your health your wellness first and you maintain your, you know, organizational um, responsibilities and your responsibilities to your patients and your residents and your students, it will all come. Uh, but that's just so, so important. And I've literally realized that more my first two years as an attending than I did as a resident um, because it's just completely different. Um, but that I know we, that's not even what you asked for, but <laughs> I just thought that was really important. <laughs> I'd probably echo what Dr. Reyes said. So I, you know, I like a routine as well in emergency medicine, depending on where you work. Um, usually if you are a nocturnist, meaning you only work at night, you do have a really good routine. Usually you can kind of make your own routine. Um, I know some nocturnists at our institution actually don't work any weekends, which is awesome. Um, but I don't have that schedule. I don't want to be a nocturnist. So um, it can be a little bit switching around. I think the beauty of though having a it's predictable because I know my schedule way in advance, but having a schedule where you may work Monday nine to five, then you know, Wednesday, you know, 
uh, four to midnight or, or what have you, having that variable schedule, you will have days off during the week where you can do a lot of the things that you need to get done, like doctor's appointments, um, visits with your kids, teachers, all of those type of life things that don't necessarily happen on the weekends. And then you'll also have some weekends off too. So although you don't have a routine, you do have variability, which actually can work out for the positive. So I'd say I'd like a routine, but I probably actually wouldn't because I like having random days off. Um, I guess something coming from a resident in training in New York, um, coming to New York, you guys have to remember, I don't, so I'm from Oregon I and California. So everything's been on the West Coast. Uh, in New York, it's a different game. We uh, start our own IVs on a lot of our patients because we're really short staff. So something that, you know, you got to be really efficient, like you got to know you're going to see your patients, you're going to start an IV, and sometimes you're also going to push them to CT. So you have to be pretty open-minded coming to do residency um, in New York City. I don't have anything to add if that's what you're waiting for. <laughs> I was I like, Dr. I, Pierce seems in thought. The, no, the, um, the, the fluctuation in hours is, I, it's really funny. When I originally was changing from OB to emergency medicine, I thought that the lifestyle would be better in emergency medicine than OB. And I found that that was totally not correct. So I guess I would have to say that, you know, the lifestyle is, you have to be okay with it. Um, it's different than any other field of medicine, but it's not, you know, every field of medicine has its less than perfect issues, probably, you know, even family medicine, you have to go and you're being pushed to see a patient in 15 minutes. So you can't talk to them beyond that period of time because you have to see four patients an hour every hour in order to be able to pay the bills. And then you're doing charts for four hours after your shifts and you're not having the time with your patients that you would want. So there's issues in every field, you know, that the shift hours and stuff are definitely, you know, definitely an issue, but I, and I guess in emergency medicine, you have to, you have to be, you have to want to be the one that is making the diagnosis. That's the most fun for sure. We diagnose and we treat in parallel. So we, we solve puzzles. You have to be, you probably want to be the kind of person that likes solving puzzles and mysteries and stuff like that. Um, but you also deal with people dying and you deal with people being really sick and, you know, you, it's high anxiety at times, not all the time, but you have to like that. You have to, you know, I tell my, you know, students that you have to get a little high off that anxiety surge. And if it makes you have an ulcer, you know, sometimes we get ulcers, but it, you have to like that in order to like emergency medicine. Um, you don't want to get, feel like that's fatiguing or whatever. It's scary. And you get, you train to have it be less scary, but, but you have to like the adrenaline surge. And, um, I personally am like Kristen. I like having different, my day be different every day. I don't uh, like, I, I changed careers. I wasn't, you know, I was in a lab for a little while. I didn't like that. I didn't like doing the same thing every day, working eight to five. And, you know, every, even though I like a routine, I didn't like that. So that's probably the trademark of emergency medicine that you have to like. But other than that, I, I don't know. I, I'm not just a perpetually, I am optimistic and I try to be happy, but I truly love what we do. We have, it is so much fun taking care of patients in the emergency department. And it's fun taking care of a person who's really, really, really sick and diagnosing them and treating them. And it's fun taking care of somebody who is not sick and you're able to figure out what they need and feeling like you're providing what they need. It's, it's a great field. It's so fulfilling and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Try not to listen to those loud, loud negative voices. Try to listen to the positive voices and, and trust your gut and 
go for what you know you've been working so hard for so long to achieve and it will you will love what you're choosing to do snaps for that that was a wonderful and powerful note to end on um thank you all again to all of the um students that showed up and listened i hope this was helpful um regardless of um what um, stage of your medical training that you are in. Thank you again so much to all of the panelists, Dr. Pierce, Smith, Dr. Reyes, and Dr. Matina. Um, you all are amazing. Um, so that concludes our session for this evening. Um, I will plug our next session um, in terms of the osteopathic mentorship series. It will be on... Of course, I do not have the date. It's in the link. It's early the first week in December, um, but it is wind down with women in EM and um, it is just a super casual social event. Um, so December 6th, amazing, Dr. Reyes. I knew you would be there. Um, so if you're listening to this recording, um, it is on the women in EM section on our website um, to get the Zoom link. But again, thank you so much for being here. Um, and this concludes our session for tonight. Have a good night, everyone. Okay. Uh -huh.